Hello, beautiful people. I'm so glad that um, I get to see all of your faces today. We are tackling recursion. Um, full disclaimer, I wouldn't talk about this if it wasn't part of the subset. Recursion, it can be kind of difficult. Like, it takes, like, this mindset, this particular mindset, in my opinion, in order to kind of talk about recursion, uh, but it is part of the subset, so we do need to talk about it. And I'm gonna leave with this quote coming out of your textbook. Yes, we have a textbook. The call pattern of a recursive method looks complicated, and the key to successful design is, of a recursive method is to not think about it. Um, we're gonna say this is uh, pretty true. It's, it's weird, let's go. So recursion is an alternative to iteration. We're talking like loops, uh, for loops, while loops, do while loops. Yes, there is something called a do while loop in Java. Um, I imagine Chase is looking it up right now. Any code segment that uses loops could use recursion or vice versa. Now, there's inevitably gonna be somebody that's like, well, what about the blah, blah, blah problem? And listen, you can use a stack data structure in conjunction with a loop and achieve the exact same things that recursion can. So yes, this is true. Any code segment that uses loops could use recursion or vice versa. So in computer science, recursion is when a method calls itself. That's it. That's technically recursion. <coughs> here we go. I've got a method here, my method. First thing that happens whenever we execute this, it's going to print out hello world. And then most importantly, we're going to execute by method. Well, that's this thing, All right? So after we print off hello world, we execute my method. I'm going to come back up, execute my method. We'll, we'll print off hello world, then call my method, which some of you should quickly recognize that this is going to cause infinite recursion. So this segment, uh, we'll call this infinite recursion. That is the recursive call stack just never terminates. And in Java, when infinite recursion occurs, it's going to call it cause a stack overflow error. And yes, that is where the name of the website stack overflow comes from. This is a runtime error, meaning that you don't encounter it until you actually execute the program, right? Because what ends up happening is that you have all of these bits of code that need to be executed, just compiling into RAM. And eventually you run out of RAM. You could go download more, but it's hard to whenever um, it's being clogged up by all these recursive calls. Uh, while there is no true syntax, so part of what makes this difficult to teach is there is no true syntax, right? Like when we're talking for loops, I'm like, boom, here's the syntax. Here's how it works. Here's how the flow of a for loop works. We're going to do this first and then this, and then we come back up and do this. That's just not the case with recursion, right? Because as we talked about, simply put, a recursive method is just a method that calls itself. So... That being said, what you're going to encounter in this course is basically going to uh, follow a very similar format. So let's look at one that's, uh, let's look at a general format. So here's my example method. We have if, here's our base case, we're gonna perform some actions. We'll talk about the base case in just a moment. Otherwise, we can perform some other actions and then the method calls itself. Right, this is a recursive method because it calls itself. Let's break this apart. In order to prevent a recursive method from producing infinite recursion, as we saw earlier with our very first example, a recursive method should define a base case. Now, a base case is a segment of code, usually an if statement that represents the simplest entity in a problem set. If you're taking notes, this is one of the first things I want you to write down. We'll get to this bottom in just a second, but a base case represents the simplest entity in a problem set. When we look at an example, that'll make a little bit more sense to you. More importantly, the base case terminates the recursive call stack. This is arguably more important, but I don't want you to just gloss over this first part, right? It, the base case represents the simplest entity in the problem set. So more importantly, the base case terminates the recursive call stack. While a recursive method can define multiple base cases, only one base case will execute in a given recursive call stack. So we're going to see examples, situations where there's actually multiple base cases written out. 
if we look back at our example, this effectively only has one base case. You could in theory have multiples, but only one will ever actually execute. So having a base case, that's gonna be essentially step one into causing our recursive call stack to finally execute and preventing the stack overflow error. But just having it is not enough. The recursive call stack actually has to reach the base case. So whatever your base case is, we have to trend towards that to eventually terminate. So um, we'll look at some examples of that. So uh, let's look at a recursive method that computes in factorial. Uh, hmm. What's factorial? Let's talk about that real fast. Maybe bring up some paint here. All right, so for instance, if I have six factorial, uh, this is a math concept. So what we're really talking about is six times five times four all the way down to one. All right, uh, what is that? 720, six times five times four, all the way down. This is, so six factorial is 720. That's what we're talking about with factorial. We actually coded this in using iteration, using loops in CSP, but we're gonna look at it in terms of um, recursion. So do have a bit of a precondition on this method. Um, if we were to pass in a negative number, it's not gonna work. So precondition n is a non-negative number, and non-negative means that zero will work. So we're gonna take in an integer. This is n, this is the value that we wanna know the factorial of. Here we see our base case. And then down here we see our recursive step along with our recursive call. So let's break this apart. This is a recursive method that can be used to compute n factorial. So it's a recursive method, how do I know? Factorial, which takes in an integer, is being called within itself, like factorial, we're passing in an integer. So this method is calling itself, that's all it needs to be considered recursive. This is specifically, we refer to it as the refer recursive call. This is the literal method call that causes a recursive call stack to form. So here we see our base case. Again, that is most often going to be uh, some type of if statement. This represents the simplest entity in our problem set. So earlier when I talked about this and said, hey, that's kind of important, don't forget about that. This base case, basically when we're computing factorial, this is the smallest number I ever care about, right? Whenever n is actually zero. So that's what we mean by it's the simplest entity in our problem set. So whenever this is true, we return one. Like that is just a very static, maybe static is not the right word. It's just a set value, right? We're guaranteed to get one as long as n is zero. This will eventually, this is our base case, it will eventually cause the recursive call stack to terminate. So if this is false, however, we're gonna jump down here. Notice I don't have to have an else because our return statement, this type of scenario is going to set up an if-else situation without actually including an else. But if n is not zero, we're going to come down here. This is known as the recursive step. In its entirety, this is the recursive step. Now, just this part that I've highlighted currently, that is the recursive call. So we see that the recursive call is a part of the recursive step. Okay. So each subsequent call is going to add code that needs to be processed. I'm going to show you a visual in just a moment that kind of shows you the stack and how that sets up. A stack is exactly what it sounds like. It's a type of structure in which the last element or process to be added is the first to be processed or executed. I want you to think of like a literal stack of papers, right? I got one sheet, two sheets, three sheets, right? If you're a teacher, Perhaps grading is starting to uh, stack up on your desk. Whenever I go to grade, the first thing I'm going to do is pull off whatever's on top of my stack. And then I'll pull off the next thing that's on my stack. So the last thing to be added to my stack is actually the first to be executed. That is, last in, first out. 
I'm sure uh, Neil's in chat. He's familiar with this deck from playing Magic the Gathering. Let's step through a factorial example to see how Recursive Call Stack is actually formed. So here's the visual. Over here on the right-hand side, I have my <coughs> recursive method, and we're going to execute it. Okay? Let's say that we want to know what 3 factorial is. Well, I'm going to call factorial passing in 3. First thing we're going to do, we're going to ask, is n equal to 0? No. So I've jumped down here to this return statement. We're going to return n, which is 3, times factorial of n minus 1. So factorial 2. Well, here, I don't know what factorial 2 is. So this is going to start forming my stack. What I have is a bit of code that needs to be processed before I can even finish what I was previously doing. So let's step inside of that. I'm going to execute factorial 2. Is n equal to 0? No. So we're going to jump down to our recursive step and we'll return n, which is 2 currently, times factorial of n minus 1. So notice that not only do I have a base case, we're actually decrementing in. We're starting to approach that base case. But just like with the last step, I don't know what factorial 1 is exactly. So let's step into that method call. We would ask, is n equal to 0? No. So we're going to go down to our recursive step, where we'll do n, which is currently 1, times factorial of n minus 1, factorial of 0. Again, I got code that I need to execute. I'm going to step inside that. Is n equal to 0? Yeah, finally. So this is the height of my call stack. Basically, I finally hit a point where I knew an exact value. There's no code that needs to be executed. There's nothing that I need to figure out before continuing. So I have things stacked up. I finally hit factorial 0, which I know the value of. So this is the part where my call stack is actually going to collapse. So factorial of 0, I know what that is. We can finish these other things. right? Factorial of 0 gives me 1. 1 times 1 is 1. So I now know factorial 1. I can finish executing that code. I can finally finish executing factorial 2 because it's going to be 2 times factorial 1, which we just realized was 1. I can do factorial 3 because I now know factorial 2. And that's how we essentially get there. Things were stacking up until I hit the base case, right? Those bits of code are waiting to be executed. They're hanging out in memory until I hit a base case, which terminates the call stack, and things can I can start figuring out things. So we saw the height of our call stack here. Once we actually reach the base case, we can start calculating and finishing out the recursive calls that are on the stack. And we kind of, uh, the last thing to be added to my stack, that is factorial zero, was the first to be executed. So last in, first out. Yeah, and that's how we get factorial three. So the factorial method is an example of tail recursion. So we got different fancy names. They're kind of generic. No one really cares. But tail recursion occurs when the recursive call is the last statement in the recursive step. Right? So the very last thing that happens in my recursive step is actually the recursive call. In practice, these methods tend to be uh, the easiest to rewrite iteratively. So we talked uh, at the very beginning of the lecture that recursion is an alternative for iteration. And I said that anything that can be written iteratively can be written recursively and vice versa. That is true. Things that are written using tail recursion tend to be really easy to rewrite iteratively. And so one thought may be, well, I don't need recursion for those things. Uh, that's kind of true. Like these math functions such as factorial, uh, Fibonacci is a very popular one when talking about recursion. They're naturally recursive. And so expressing them using recursion is kind of nice. What we're going to see a little bit in the future is um, like the reason why. Why do you want recursion? If we could just replace it with iteration, what's the point? Now, I have a, a small theory that because we learned iteration first, we tend to favor iteration. If we would have learned recursion first, maybe that's our jam. Maybe that's what we're into. 
and we wouldn't like iteration as much. I don't know if that really holds <laughs> because I'm a big fan of iteration and don't really like recursion, but here we are. That doesn't mean that tail recursion is bad, right? The fact that we can take something that is written using tail recursion and rewrite it iteratively may make you think that that should have just been iterative to begin with. That's not necessarily true. We'll see. All it merely means is that non-tail recursive methods are justifiably recursive. That is, if something isn't tail recursion and it is using recursion, it's justifiably using recursion. That is, it is much harder to rewrite using iteration. Let's look at an example, a recursive method that has statements after the recursive call, that is, it is not using tail recursion, and specifies a void return type. These are two things that basically can't happen, right? A method doesn't have to return something in order to be recursive. It can be void, and uh, the recursive call doesn't have to be the last thing. So here's our mystery method. It is a recursive method. Why? Mystery is calling itself. Okay. We have our base case here. If n is less than or equal to zero, this is just printing something. Like it's going to cause our call stack to stop. Otherwise, we're going to have a recursive call. And notice that something actually happens after our recursive call. Okay. Let's look at this visually. So uh, we notice that we have a recursive call. We'll have our call stack kind of show up up here. And I have console down at the bottom, go away, that will show basically our output. All right, so we're going to call mystery3. We're passing in 3 as a value for n. We're going to ask, is n less than or equal to 0? No. We'll jump down to our else. What's going to happen here is that we're going to call mystery of n minus 1. That is mystery of two. Well, let's step inside that. Now, <coughs> spoiler, <laughs> there's this print statement that we have not executed in mystery three. We're gonna to have to come back to that. This is part of the reason that recursion is a little bit harder than iteration, because in the case of iteration, once you do something, you just move on. But we have stuff that is waiting to be executed that we can't execute till we do something else, and so we'll come back to it. So let's step inside of mystery two. We'll ask, is n less than or equal to zero? No. So we jump down to this else. It adds something else to my recursive call stack. Is n less than or equal to zero? No. So we jump down to our else. Is n less than or equal to zero? Yes. We finally hit the base case. We're going to execute it. This is the height of my call stack. Right? I have these calls that have stacked up. They are waiting to execute. Now that we've hit the base case, I can actually go back and finish executing this thing. So we'll, mystery of zero will allow us to print off the current value of zero. It's just zero. We see that down in our console. Okay. I jump back to mystery one because it had code that needs to be executed. Well, inside of that call, the value of n was one. So when we hit this print statement, we're going to print off one. I need to go back to mystery two. It had code that was waiting to execute. In that call, the value of n is 2. So whenever we print off n, we'll see a 2 in our console down below. Lastly, still on the stack, waiting to execute, is mystery 3. In that method call, the value of n is 3. It shows up in my console, and our stack has fully collapsed. Okay, so with that in mind, we're going to hit some coding bat. I'm going to walk through this one. Um, if you want to pull up coding bat and go along with me, that's cool. Don't forget to log in. If you have to log in, if you don't, you don't need one. It's okay. We're going to hit bunny ears one. And a lot of this unit, there's not a lot of slides, right? Just as we talked about earlier, chat's going crazy for coding bat. Um, as we talked about earlier, there's not like true syntax. There's not a lot of facts that I can just give you about how this works. It's going to be practice. So I don't have a lot of slides but we're going to hit some practice and let's see what we got. All right, here's some coding back. I'm going to click on our recursion one. Notice factorial is the first one here. Maybe we'll come back and plug in our solution to factorial, but I want to look at bunny ears. We have a number of bunnies <laughs> and each bunny has two big floppy ears. We want to compute the total number of ears 
across all bunnies recursively without loops or multiplication. Okay, that text that says without loops or multiplication is very important because as it turns out, um, this is just like two times bunnies and we can do it using multiplication or we could use loops. But what we want to do is look at recursion. So you're not gonna have an FRQ involving recursion. You never ever have to actually write recursion, which is why we're not even gonna have a project on recursion. What you're going to experience on the test is um, just multiple choice questions dealing with recursion. So we're gonna end up looking at a lot of those, but in my opinion, if you can write recursion, then you can basically step through or trace uh, the recursive calls and get the correct answer on some type of multiple choice question. So let's look at this. First thing we need is basically some type of base case in theory. All right, we have a number of bunnies and each bunny has two big floppy ears. We want to compute the total number of, of ears across all the bunnies recursively. So they show you right here in the example that uh, the value of bunnies can be zero. So this represents my base case. Simply put, if bunnies is equal to zero, this is my base case. We're going to return zero. Otherwise, then this is the harder part. This is where we gotta come up with some type of recursive call. In this case, we're going to return to plus, right, because each bunny has two ears. Here's my recursive call, bunny ears, bunnies minus one. Okay. Maybe, um, yeah, there we go. I don't know why to think about that. So our base case, the smallest entity in our problem set is if a bunny has no ears, rip, poor guy, we're gonna return zero. Otherwise, our recursive step, we have a recursive call. That's what makes this method recursive, is it is calling itself, right? We'll put two on the stack along with, let's keep computing. So not only do we have a base case, but in theory, whatever our number is, provided it's not negative, we're going to approach that base case, okay? Uh, we'll hit a little go on this. See that we got something kind of right here. But what I like to do now is maybe look at um, a recursive call stack. Maybe text is a better way to go with this. I don't know. All right. So let's say that I want to know how many ears, bunny ears. I want to know how many ears four bunnies have. First thing we're going to do, we're going to ask, is bunnies equal to zero? Well, no, it's four. Okay, so we're going to jump down to our recursive call step. And what that does is we're going to have two plus bunny ears of three. Right, because bunnies minus one. Bunny, bunny ears in this call is four. Okay, well, I don't know what bunny ears three is. So I'm going to step inside that recursive call. We're going to ask, is bunnies equal to zero? No, bunnies is three. Okay, we'll jump down to our recursive call. Oh, maybe we can make this font bigger. Uh, zoom. Okay, so we'll step inside this recursive call. Bunnies ear, bunny ears three. I don't know what this is. So we're going to ask, is bunnies equal to zero? No, so we're gonna put onto the call stack two plus bunny ears of two. I don't know what bunny ears of two is. So I need to step inside that call. Inside that call, bunnies equal to zero? No, so we'll jump down. We'll do two plus bunny ears of one. I'm gonna step inside of this recursive call. In that call, is bunnies equal to zero? Nope. So we're gonna put onto the call stack two plus bunny ears of zero. Okay, let's step inside of bunny ears zero. Is bunnies equal to zero? Yeah, so bunny ears of zero is the first thing I know about. It is zero. 
So this is the height of my recursive call stack. Notice that the last thing to be added is the first to come out, right? And so we're actually going to kind of work backwards up through the call stack. Well, two plus zero, that's going to give me the value of bunny ears of one. Two plus zero, that's two. So now that I know bunny ears of one, we could in theory just replace this, right? I could just put that two there if that uh, helps y'all out. Okay, I now know, I can now calculate bunny ears of two. Well, it's two plus two, it is four. I can now calculate bunny ears of three. It's two plus four, six. And I can now calculate bunny ears of four, which is two plus six or eight. Four bunnies, they got eight ears, in theory. Yeah, that's overly complicated, but it's recursion. Let's take a look at the next one. Uh, I think it's Fibonacci. Very, very famous one. People love talking about Fibonacci whenever they talk about recursion. So the Fibonacci sequence, famous bit of mathematics, and it happens to have a recursive definition. So what they're talking about here is that literally the mathematical definition of the Fibonacci sequence is naturally recursive. What that means is this is the kind of method, this is the kind of code where writing it recursively might be a pretty good idea. Um, I'm gonna go in, spoiler alert, you don't actually wanna use recursion to write the Fibonacci sequence, but whatever. The first two values in the sequence are zero and one. Okay, there should be some alarm bells going off. This sounds like base cases to me, right? They're telling me um, essentially the simplest entities in the problem set. Each subsequent value is the sum of the previous two values. So the whole sequence is zero and one, right? Here's my first two numbers. We add those up to get the next one in the sequence. Well, to get the next number in the sequence, two, I'm gonna add up these two numbers. To get the next number in sequence, three, I'm gonna add up these two numbers. Y'all know what the Fibonacci sequence is. Define a recursive Fibonacci in method that returns the nth Fibonacci number with n equals zero representing the start of the sequence. Mm, so that can be our base case. Yeah, all right, let's hop to it. Ah, bunny ears. So we're gonna take in an integer n. They give us some examples. When it's zero, we get back zero. When it's one, we get back one. We're going to see something kind of clever here with our base case in just a moment. And whenever Fibonacci is 2, we should get back 1, so on and so forth. So, um, start with the base cases. Sure, if n is equal to 0, they're quite hint. They hit pretty, pretty heavily at this. n equals 0 representing the start of the sequence. This sounds like the base case. right? If n is equal to 0, we'll just return 0. Okay, now there's some clever bits that we can start getting into. For instance, notice that if we have Fibonacci of one, we get back a one. If we have Fibonacci of two, we get back one. And up here, it's essentially saying we got two base cases. So we can actually lump these two together and get something like if n is less than or equal to two, in both of those cases, right, where we either have a one or a two, I've already handled zero, but if we got a one or a two, we return one. So what I want you to kind of recognize <coughs> right off the bat here, that's not a coding bad joke, I promise, that we actually have two base cases, but as our slides indicated earlier, only one of these will actually execute. Let's continue. So essentially the Fibonacci sequence is, well, whatever the first two numbers were added together. So here's where things get crazy. We're hitting, we're hitting our recursive step where we're going to do Fibonacci n minus 1. That is, I'm trying to calculate the current number. I need to know what is the number before this. I also need to know what is the number two numbers before this in the sequence. So here's the solution to our, um, our Fibonacci. The actual sequence is the two preceding numbers, that is n minus one added together plus n minus two. All right, let's try this out and we'll talk about this thing. Ooh, ah. 
All right, to our text. Let's trace it. And mm, this is going to be a little bit harder. Maybe we should be drawing here. Let's bring up some MS Paint. Ooh, that's gross. So, how do I make this bigger? Color, size, there we go. Oh yeah, that'll work. Okay, so I'm gonna just abbreviate the call to Fibonacci with an F. Ooh, I am no Salcon. Uh, let's say we wanna know what Fibonacci four is. <laughs> so let's step inside that. Is n equal to zero? No. Is n less than or equal to two? No. Well, I'm going to have Fibonacci of n minus one. Fibonacci of n minus one, that's Fibonacci of three. Plus Fibonacci of n minus two, that is Fibonacci of two. Okay. Here I have a stack starting to form because I don't know what these things are. I, I need to step inside these method calls to actually execute them and see what their values are. So our stack is starting to form. Now, what you should notice is this is slightly different from the previous call stack because what we're getting is a, a lot more like a tree structure. It's still a stack. I still have stuff that is stacking waiting to be executed, but let's step inside these. Realities are we can do either one, doesn't matter. So I'm going to step inside of f of 3. Right? We're going to ask, is n equal to 0? No. Is it less than or equal to 2? No. So we're going to have a call stack form where f of 3 is going to be f of n minus 1, which is 2, plus <coughs> f of 1. Okay, That's what's happening over here on the left-hand side. I got stuff stacking up. I can't execute it yet. I don't know what these values are. We can step inside these. We can come over here. It doesn't matter. Why don't we come over here to f of 2? Is n equal to 0? No. Is n less than or equal to 2? Yes. I know what f of 2 is. It's 1. We could just cross this out and put a 1 value there. Why don't we do that? Because I actually know what the value is at this point. Now over here, I can step inside these. f of 2? Is n equal to 0? No. Is it less than or equal to 2? Yes. So I actually know what f of 2 is. Cross that out. We'll do a 1. Plus f of 1. Is n equal to 0? No. Is it less than or equal to 2? Yeah. This is a 1. So I actually know what these values are, right? f of 3 is 1 plus 1, or just simply put 2. I know what f of 2 is. We just executed that earlier. So I can now finally calculate f of 4. It's 2 plus 1 or three. Okay, we had a call stack kind of form, and the last things to get added were the first to be executed. Uh, maybe we should do another one of these, go a little bit deeper. Does this have a size on my eraser? Yeah, uh, let's do, let's do this. Okay, steady hand, you can do this with. Let's go F of five. Adding just one more. Let's step inside that. Is n equal to zero? No. Is it less than or equal to two? No. So we're going to have a tree start to form where we have f of n minus one. That is f of four. Plus f of three. Okay. Again, I got code here. I don't know what the values are yet. So I need to step inside of those methods to kind of see what they are f of 4. Well, that's not 0. It's not less than or equal to 2, so we're going to do f of 3 plus f of 2. Okay. Again, I can continue down this path or I can jump over here. It's kind of your choice. We can't really figure things out until we hit some base cases. So, I'm going to maybe just step over here. f of 3. Well, that is f of 2 
plus f of 1. f of 2 is actually something I can figure out because that's going to hit one of our base cases. Is n equal to 0? No. Is it less than or equal to 2? Yes. Why don't we use a different color here? I know what this is. This is 1. Booyah. Okay. So over here, our f of 2 call, again, we know what that is. That hits one of our base cases. This gives me back 1. f of 1 also hits a base case. That gives me back 1. Okay. And with that, I know what f of 3 is. We got 1 plus 1. f of 3 is 2. Now over here, I could continue to tree out, but we actually solved f of 3 on the left-hand side. Um, spoiler, this is part of the reason that using recursion is not actually the best way to solve Fibonacci is that I already know what f of 3 is, but I'm having to compute it all over again. Like in actuality, when this code goes to be executed, we're literally going to go through this all over again. But because I calculated f of 3 over here, I'm just going to simplify that to a 2. Now I can figure out f of 4. We got 2 plus 1. f of 4 is 3. And we can figure out f of 5 finally, which is 3 plus 2, or 5. So, this is essentially both parts of it, right? We got, we're writing a method, we're following the call stack. Most importantly, you need to be able to do these call stacks, but I feel that in writing um, out the methods that you, you gain a lot. Um, some different ways to kind of rewrite this particular coding back problem Right. In the event that n is 0 or 1, we're just literally returning n. So one way that you can kind of express this, if n is less than or equal to 1, we could just return n itself. And then we don't have to worry about uh, the other case. I don't believe. Yeah. So here is a slightly different variant. Uh, we only have one base case in this scenario and this is also kind of an example of why teaching recursion can be a little bit difficult because there's like no true syntax you, you gotta just not think about it as our quote said let's recap in computer science a function or method I want you to <laughs> give me these answers in, uh, in Twitch chat in computer science a function or method is considered recursive if that's right calls itself. Any code segment that can be done blank can be done recursively or vice versa. This is actively great. Thank you guys. Iteratively. In Java, infinite recursion will produce a ooh. Mm -hmm. uh, stack overflow I believe is what I'm looking for I kind of would have also accepted um, a runtime error because that's what this is right we don't know until we actually execute it in a recursive method a segment of code that represents the simplest entity problem set and causes the recursive call stack to terminate is known as Base case. True or false, if a recursive method defines a base case, it will eventually terminate. Ooh. Our 50-50 question is actually dividing Twitch chat. This is false. Just simply having a base case is not enough. You actually have to approach it as well. Uh, let's see if we can go back. This is probably fine. So take a look at my factorial. Here's my base case, if n equals 0. Right, we return 1. Down here, I have the recursive call inside of my recursive step. And in theory, as long as n is a non-negative integer, we are approaching the base case. n is going to get smaller and smaller and smaller. Eventually, n will be 0, and that's the point at which we stop. 
Now, if I do just factorial of n, n doesn't get smaller. If I do factorial of n plus 1, n is actually getting larger. That means we're going away from the base case. So having the base case is not enough. You actually have to approach it as well. Recursive methods can define multiple base cases. True or false? Okay, this is true. Uh, we can have multiple base cases. We actually saw an example of that with our first uh, version of Fibonacci. And uh, just because we have multiple base cases, only, uh, actually, I may be giving away the next question. Only one base, case, one base case will be executed in a given recursive call stack. True or false? This is true, guys. Only one base case will be executed in a given recursive call stack. So based on our last question, we can have multiple base cases. But as things stack up, only one of those base cases will actually execute and will actually cause that call stack to, uh, to terminate. So this is true. Only one base case will actually be executed. In a recursive method, what is the recursive step? This is a much longer question. Uh, mm, a step that is recursive. Uh, kind of a bogus question, I'm not going to lie. It, it's basically everything that's not the base case is the recursive step. And that includes the recursive call. Whatever. True or false? Elements or processes that are added to a stack will be processed in or executed in first in, first out, or FIFO order. Okay. This is false. There is a name for that data structure. It's known as a queue, which is the, uh, the first thing that you put in is the first thing to be processed. But our recursive call stack is a stack. That is the last thing that is put on. It's the first thing to actually pop off or to be executed. Okay. Um, here is... Homework. I want you to do coding bat recursion one triangle. Okay. And starting tomorrow, we'll actually take a look at uh, solutions to that. You got a solution um, that you're very proud of. Hit me up on Discord and I'll take a look at your solution. You can either paste it there or I can go dig into coding bat and see that. But um, that's going to wrap up our discussion for today. Class dismissed.